This episode of The Meat House is brought to you by Amoretti, the ultimate manufacturer of brewers' natural infusions, craft purees, and concentrates to bring your next batch to the next level. Click on the link in the episode description below to see their full lineup of flavors. Use promo code MEATHOUSE at checkout to save 15% off your next order. These guys can't hear the uh, the lead-in music. I changed it up this week, and uh, I, I turned the cue off, so, uh, so you guys can't hear it. But uh, if uh, any of you guys sitting around the table get around to listening to this week, prepare to rock your brains out. A um, couple of things. Uh, uh, here. Uh, we just had this little chat before we came on the air. Uh, and then we did put a Facebook uh, posting out uh, this evening. Tonight's show is going to be the last one that we do live. Um, we wanted to have a little bit more flexibility. We're going to continue doing it as a podcast, uh, which are becoming more and more popular uh, these days. So look for the Mead House in the typical location, Stitcher, Podcastpedia, of course, our own website, themeadhouse.com. Uh, so we're going to focus on on uh, on doing it strictly as a podcast. Now we'll still have live guests on occasion, and hey, if you want to call the show, nothing has changed as far as our scheduling goes. Uh, we're still uh, doing the recorded show at 9 p.m. on Tuesday night, so that's not foreseeable future. So, uh, but we'll certainly put uh, put some information up on the on the Facebook. In fact, I might even task one of these guys uh, with it. And uh, at least you kind of give you a heads up uh, what we're going to be talking about in the next week or two and give you an opportunity to call the show uh, if you've got something to say or want to get in on on the discussion. So uh, with that, uh, you know, our replays are always available at the Mead House, iTunes, Stitcher, uh, Podcastpedia, uh, and uh, uh, we're, uh, we're happy that you're here. Uh, next week, guys, um, I got this reminder from Ryan today. Uh, next week, uh, a uh, former Mazer Cup winner. I don't know. If you, is he a former Mazer Cup winner, Ryan, or Mazer Cup well, winner? He, how, how would you say that? <laughs> I, I would just say Mazer Cup winner. He he won a medal last year. Last year, yeah, because we don't want to, you know, we know the Mazer Cup is going on now, so. We don't want to confuse anybody, but uh, Greg Fisher from Wild Blossom Meadery, he'll be in the house uh, with us here at the table. Uh, he's out of Chicago, so we'll look for that next week. And uh, thanks, Ryan, for putting that together. Uh, the Facebook deal, you know where it's at, the Meat House. Uh, just simply type in the Meat House uh, up there, and that little search deal will come right up. Getting a lot of activity uh, there as well. Uh, the website, uh, you ought to know by now, themeadhouse.com. That's where we live. Uh, Ryan Richardson in the house tonight uh, because he's allergic to shellfish. We'll get into that here in a little bit. Aaron Martin along for the ride. Mississippi Chris Spencer, Jeff Schaus in the house. My name is J.D. Webb. Uh, Jeff, did you find anything on Facebook worth talking about here tonight? Well, you know, actually um – Concerning guests, I did see something on Facebook that was really, uh, really interesting. I wanted to bring up. It's the only thing I have to talk about tonight. Um, but uh, one of our first guests, Eric Newquist, actually posted on uh, on Mead Makers this week a comparison side by side, um, showing a batch that he had put some bentonite in primary on, and a batch that he hadn't put any findings in, and it made a really dramatic difference. Um, now this was this was on the advice of another. Uh, Another person is pretty active. In fact, I think he's one of the admins on the Meat Makers group, uh, John Talkington. And um, you know, the, there's some ongoing discussion with. Uh, with well, throw that dog sorry, a bone. With, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's some ongoing discussion with uh, you know using bentonite as a finding agent and um, how it can kind of leave a, a, a gritty taste or a, a, a minerally taste. Uh, sometimes when used it after, you know, secondary or in, in uh, bulk aging or things like that, uh, yeah. apparently doing that in primary alleviates that problem and leaves you with a really nice, settled, clear, uh, clear batch. So 
that struck me as something that I want to check out in the future too, um, just as a, another way to, to make a nice clear mead that's ready a little bit faster. You know, uh, these wine kits that I do come with a little package of bentonite and the instructions, uh, call for you to, uh, that's the first thing that goes into your fermenter is the bentonite, uh, mm-hmm. you know, with some hot water and, uh, uh, you know, uh, keep it moving, pour it in, stir it up and then, uh, and then add your juice. So, uh, I don't see that, why that wouldn't work for me too, you know? Right. And I think it's by that same kind of a logic that, you know, winemakers do this. So why wouldn't it work for me to that, uh, you know, that the idea initially came up in the first place, but, uh, yeah, yeah no, it looks like Eric is getting some good results from doing that. And so it seems like something I, I want to try myself. Yeah. You know, I don't like putting. I mean, I've I've got the that two part, and I can't ever remember the name of those two chemicals uh, that go in there. But uh, you know, it's that clear. Salmon kisolol. Yeah, uh, I've used that in the past, and I really don't. I, I just don't like adding that kind of stuff after the fact. And uh, I'm more inclined to just let it sit and clear naturally. I'll only use that stuff if. You know, if if it just you know won't clear at all, and uh, even the wines that I make, I, I I don't care to use that. I let it sit in a carboy for months on end until the glass is uh, you know fairly clear when uh, uh, when I tip uh, when I uh, get a drink out. So, but uh, anything else there, Thank Jeff? You. Oh, go no, ahead. That was really all I saw. Uh, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, speaking of Ryan's uh, shellfish allergies, I just wonder how the uh, kytosan and kisosol, uh sits well with him or not, because it's a shellfish derivative. Yeah. Yeah, I've um, I've never used it before. Um, now, I've also heard that the level at which those chemicals are pulverized or sorry, it eliminates any protein that would still be in it. Um, you know, the the example that I give also is that I think up until maybe this year, or maybe they're still doing it, Guinness, Guinness beer used, um, you know, a shellfish derivative as their clearing agent. So I've had Guinness, I mean, countless times, and I've never had uh, any reaction to to the Guinness. Um, and so, you know, again, I've never personally used it, but um, you know, from what I've heard, it's it's so it's in it's been broken down to such a degree that there's none of that um, that and take protein or whatever in it anymore that would, uh, that would trigger an allergic reaction. Yeah. That's good to know because that's sort of my go-to finding agent if I have to use it. Yeah. I've never seen, uh, I've never seen a warning on the side of a Guinness can that said, uh, if you're allergic to shellfish. (laughs) Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, dude, I mean, I feel sorry for you, man. I really do. Uh, crab salad, uh, crab legs, uh, lobster. Uh, I mean, I can go on and on and on, but I just, you know, I don't want you to feel bad. <laughs> no, it's all right. <laughs> hey, um, I, you know, the, the what are we drinking? Th- Let me tell you, I've had I've had so much alcohol today. I've had two meads, uh, courtesy of uh, Aaron, uh, today, uh, thinking, you know, well, we'll just, you know, pick one out, and each one of us will just, you know, because we're going to talk about that tonight. Uh, so just grab one and, and you know, uh, do it. And, you know, of course, the email started going around. Let's do Crystal. Oh, God. Okay, I started out with Calypso. So I've got two meads, two beers. And I'm working on. I'm drinking. Uh, I'm drinking an apple cider that I bottled here a, a few days ago. This is a cider. It's just straight up Mott's apple juice. Just straight up, nothing added. Just uh, uh, Mott's apple juice fermented with Nottingham uh, ale yeast. 
no sugar added, no honey added, no nothing. Uh, when I hit the uh, secondary, I dropped, now this is a three gallon batch. I dropped three cinnamon sticks in it. Uh, and then we had that discussion on cinnamon. And after that, I'm thinking, Oh crap. I hope I didn't put too much in. This thing is perfect. It came out. It's not cinnamony. Uh, it's got, you, you get a little bit of a cinnamon bite to it. It's nice and tart. Uh, it's refreshing. Uh, it's beer like. Not quite a Magners, Chris, but uh, I'll tell you, uh, I'm very pleased with this. And it's just, like I said, just simply apple juice, period. Uh, Aaron, what's in your glass tonight? Well, I think uh, in honor of our, our hopped meat experiment tasting tonight, I'm actually just about to pour myself a, a glass. This is actually my last bottle of the Crystal Hop Mead, so... Um, we'll be excited to to pour a glass of that and see what you guys' thoughts are on it. Yeah, Aaron sent around. Um, uh, he, he sent us each a uh, a uh, little box full of mead, uh, three meads, and this is a this is an experiment. This is a hop experiment that he did. We're going to be talking about this here shortly, and then uh, of course he emailed us some forms uh, that we had to fill out. So uh, kind of anxious to get to that discussion here in a little bit too. Uh, Jeff, what are you drinking tonight, bud? Well, um, for the moment, I have cracked into the uh, the crystal hopped uh, mead that Aaron sent us. Get a good taste off that. And you know, if I decide that I haven't had quite enough to drink, I've also got a uh, a, a beer from uh, our local brewery, Boulevard, their tasting room series. It's a uh, a rosemary IPA. Rosemary. Rosemary. So that sounded interesting. Something I ought to I ought to check out. So. Uh, Wow. Well, we'll see if I get to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I want to hear about that one. I mean, I love rosemary. I love cooking with rosemary. Uh, be anxious to hear about that one. She sounds like a great girl. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, Mississippi, uh, it's either, I'm going to guess, it's either Starbucks uh, or if you've had the kind of day I think you've had, that might be some kind of an alcoholic beverage. What is it? Uh, well, I boycotted Starbucks. You know that. So it's oh, not there you Starbucks. Go. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. That's... Yeah. Uh, so, uh, no, I'm, I'm sitting by waiting to do the tasting notes on, on Aaron's crystal. Cool. All right. Uh, Ryan, what'd you pour, man? Well, this is the first time all day that I've uh, had a chance to have a drink. So I had I, I'm drinking the crystal so that I can uh, I'm filling out my note sheet here as we speak. Cool. Everybody's drinking crystal. I drank the crystal earlier, right after I drank the calypso. So <laughs> I've got more alcohol floating around in my body right now. I don't, you know, just this apple cider. Luckily, it's only about 6%, so uh, that, that's all I need. Um, we uh, Last week, we, we got into this thing. We were, we were talking about themed meads. I got this harebrained idea that we'd ought to put something together for, uh, you know, some kind of a holiday thing or some kind of a theme, whether there's July 4th, Halloween, uh, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, the, the one that sticks out in my mind that I'm really, uh, I'm really eager to talk more about, and I'm hoping one of you came up with a bona fide recipe that looks like it might work is this licorice thing, uh, for Halloween. I, I just think that's awesome. Um, uh, but I thought we'd spend a little bit of time today and see if we can't, you know, uh, nail down a recipe and, uh, uh, I know I, I kind of asked Chris and Aaron to, uh, uh, to, uh, kind of take this, uh, this one on with a little bit of input from Jeff, but, uh, uh, I know Chris has been busy all week, but Aaron, were you able to come up with anything at all or put any ideas down, uh, other than what we talked about last week? You know, I, I have, and I will tell you, I don't know that it's a finished product yet, but, um, after our discussion last week about the watermelon mead, which, you know, I was kind of thinking would be yeah. a nice summery 4th of July type of a mead, um, 
we got a, a comment on the Facebook account from Scott Monroe, one of our, our longtime regular listeners, with a couple of watermelon wine recipes. And uh, just kind of reading through those, I've adapted uh, more like the second one that he shared with us to what I'm calling more of like a 4th of July watermelon mellow piment. So it's uh, watermelon juice and some white grape juice concentrate um, that, that I'm going to alter his recipe a little bit that he shared with us with some honey. Um, and again, it's, I, I'm not quite sure I've settled on the right ratios or amounts of the different ingredients, but, um, there's also a, a special ingredient that goes in there too, that I think might intensify the hop or the, the watermelon flavor a little bit too. Um, so definitely excited to, to share some thoughts on that. Didn't I see somewhere, I, I don't remember if I saw it in an email, but something watermelon came through, uh, and it may, maybe it was that, I don't remember, but so, something that, um, it was it was a watermelon concentrate. Uh, where did I see that, guys? Or maybe well, you guys didn't see it. might have been it. this. I, <clears throat> well, let me let me maybe walk through a little bit of this watermelon thing that that I've got at least the kind of the structure of here, and maybe we can flesh it out a little bit. So I'm I'm thinking of like a five gallon batch, and in in one of these recipes that Scott shared with us, it actually calls for this Tropicana watermelon juice. And I was doing a little bit of research on this, and it looks like it you know there's no preservatives or artificial sweeteners or flavors. It, it looks like it really is just, you know, some sugar, watermelon juice, maybe some apple juice in there as well. Um, and they come in these 59 fluid ounce containers. Um, and for this, this batch that Scott shared, he, I think had specified, or this recipe called out for eight of these 59 fluid ounce containers. Um, I, I think he's also got, has this recipe mixing in two cans of frozen 100% white grape juice concentrate. And um, this is where I'm going to divert a little bit from, from his recipe. So I think from there, um, he's suggesting that we add just sugar. I'm thinking let's let's substitute the sugar for honey to make it more of like a melomel piment type of a, a drink. Um, so... So with those ingredients, the, the Tropicana watermelon juice, the white grape juice concentrate, and the honey, in some ratio, I want to try to get that up to about a, a starting gravity of 1.12. Um, and I'm thinking with all of that, it might only, you might only need maybe three gallons of water once you've, you've got all of the other ingredients mixed up in there. Yeah. I think uh, I don't know if he was suggesting sugar. I think what it what it was was that he found a, a recipe for the wine, and he yes. was just suggesting that this is a, a starting point for a mead. So, uh, I believe I saw somewhere it was written that he he pulled it off maybe Jack Keller's website or something for a wine. So that's yeah. probably why it had the sugar in it. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I've seen that website. He's got all kinds of. Uh, Oh, uh, I guess they call them country wines and and stuff, uh, fruit wines and that kind of thing on her. Um, okay, I just had a wild. I just I was thinking of back thinking back to my childhood. We used to get these hard candies called Jolly Ranchers, and I love the watermelon. You could still make them. Uh, I wonder if that would impart any watermelon flavor. <laughs> And you know, well, it's funny, funny you bring that up. That I think is this secret ingredient that I had alluded to. Um, so the, the recipe that he shared with us actually calls for over 50 of those watermelon Jolly Ranchers melted into a pint of water, <laughs> uh, mix it in in secondary. And I, I've got to think that's going to intensify <laughs> that watermelon flavor. For I, sure. I mean, hell, we're dropping all kinds of other crap into secondary. Why not some Jolly Ranchers? <laughs> Exactly. And based on my based on my previous experience with watermelon, I am not opposed to the Jolly Ranchers at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that would that might be a good way to go because <clears throat> the watermelon juice itself is not getting the job done. <laughs> 
No. <laughs> Although, and this may be my own preference, but I've, I've never really particularly thought that the watermelon Jolly Rancher tastes right when it comes to a watermelon flavor. It kind of tastes like that, uh, the bad fast food strawberry shake where you, <laughs> you see what they're trying to do, but it's not getting there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, the watermelon by itself is even worse. Uh, how how can a piece of natural watermelon be such a bad representation of watermelon? But it is in a mead. So, uh, <laughs> um, well, I did see. Um, gosh, I can't remember where the hell I saw it now. Uh, I, I saw some reference to a watermelon concentrate, uh, like a big jug. It was like a quart jug. Uh, and it looked like you dilute this stuff down and make like a fruit punch. Only it was mo- it was watermelon flavor, and I don't recall where I saw it. And uh, I've tried to skim through our Facebook page to see if that's where I saw it. It may have been I don't know uh, if, if somebody's got the Facebook up and can get to it. Um, as I, I my the way my monitors are configured here, I got to look way away from the screen to the other side of the desk here to look at the other screen. So, um, but I'm sure I saw that somewhere. So I think you're on the right track, Aaron. Does Does Kool Aid make a watermelon flavor? I don't know. I will I'm check on that, that here. Pull, pull it up the old Google. That might be a, an option also. Where was that, uh, Chris? You you were using uh, you were using a company online. You were buying uh, your concentrate for um, was it the uh, Heart Murmur? Yeah, the uh, Brownwood Acre Farms. Yeah, is that it? Yeah, I, w- I wonder if yeah. they have. Yeah, they 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 don't have watermelon. No. Oh, okay. Now, they've well, got a I, lot, though. They've got a lot of different concentrates, and and people who are looking to uh, to make a, a anywhere from three to six gallon batch, you really need to uh, check their website out. They've they've got blueberry and uh, raspberry, tart cherry. Um, gosh, I can't remember. They got several different ones, and and their concentrates are, are very high quality. Yeah. I like this. Uh, I, I like this watermelon idea, Aaron. Uh, and uh, let's uh, let's try to pursue this further. I like the recipe you got going here. You know, I mean, if you can make a wine, uh, you know, Scott found those uh, wine recipes. I mean, I don't see any reason why you can't substitute the, the sugar for the honey. I mean, what the hell's the difference here? Uh, and uh, you know, That's what I'm and, thinking. And, yeah, so I, I think something, I think this, uh, you know, we'll call this our 4th of July mead. Um, let's uh, let's kind of nail this down. Shoot me an email with your notes, and uh, we'll, we'll put it up on the website, see if we can entice somebody to uh, put it together, and uh, give us a call. Let us know uh, how it worked out for you. Uh, and... Um, uh, I I may be able to do. I've got some one gallon stuff uh, sitting right here that uh, that I can do a small one gallon. All my five gallon stuff is full, but uh, that sounds good. Anything uh, anything else, guys? On on holiday, uh, I know we talked about this blackberry black currant uh, Halloween thing, but I also like this licorice idea. How 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 would we work licorice? What other uh, what else do you pair licorice with? Or did we get I, that far? Uh, well, we you know, as far as getting the licorice, uh, you've got a couple of options. You've got licorice root, you've got star anise, and uh, let's see, what else have we got here? Yeah, star anise, I, I see that used frequently, or well, not frequently, but I see it used in meads on occasion. Uh, so that might be an idea. But what would you would you put it with something else, or just do a straight up licorice mead? Uh, you know, I would have to go back and read the book, uh, read the description in the book because I pull that from the the idea of the Harry Potter 
uh, series. So, really, you're not you're, uh, not you're not you're not publicly you're not publicly divulging the fact that you read Harry Potter books. I didn't read it. I watched the movies, but my wife and daughter read it. <laughs> okay, we didn't read the book, but he watched the movies. Uh, yeah, I don't have time to read the book. I, I would okay. rather watch the movie. Yeah, you read medical journals. <laughs> mm. um, yeah, I like this licorice idea for Halloween. Uh, I'd like to push that a little further. What, what kind of pair up the anise with? You mean, uh, what did you say? What kind of honey? You kind of yeah, you kind yeah, of what, checked out there for a second. Yeah, what kind of honey? Yeah, I'm always checking out, dude. Uh, what kind of honey would you pair anise with? Blackberry blossom. Um, okay. Maybe a small amount of buckwheat. Um, maybe a small amount or maybe a third of uh, a really dark wildflower if it was a real bold wildflower yeah. i can see uh black locust honey or acacia honey either one would work good something was that with some definite backbone to it yeah um, are, uh, are there i mean off the top of your head without referring back to the harry potter thing i mean what uh maybe jeff and and the boys can ch- chime in here what what other flavors guys uh, would you put up with the with the anise? Uh, knowing that you know the anise is a pretty that's a pretty potent you know flavor all by itself. So it is, and I would have trouble thinking of something that wouldn't kind of get lost against it. Um, you know, when I when I think of the licorice flavors, there are um, there are really few that to my mind like stand up to it or really complement it well. Um, so I think I would have to, to go back to the drawing board and do some, some thinking about that myself, really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think same maybe here. The, only thing, the only thing in my mind that, that would go would be uh, something toward a root beer, something like a sarsaparilla, uh, kind yeah. of a licorice sarsaparilla, maybe with a little vanilla and secondary or something. Um, I've always thought that that vanilla would would smooth the edges on licorice because I, I always saw licorice as having this sort of a bitter, rough edge to it that that didn't appeal to me. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm thinking that maybe the vanilla might take that edge off. I don't know. It might it might clash with it entirely. But and to be honest, I think that's part of the reason why. Things like star anise or uh, fennel that are similar to that black licorice, but not quite, are more popular in this usage than uh, the actual like licorice root, just because there's um, it, it's a little bit more forgiving and a little bit like less harsh on the palate than the licorice root itself, even though it's a similar flavor profile. Yeah, you mm-hmm. mentioned fennel last week, Jeb. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so that might be an idea. <clears throat> I could see going the complete opposite end of the of the wheel, and I could see trying to uh, juxtaposition it with like a sweet cherry. Yeah, yeah, that's a you really interesting that. idea. Mm-hmm. Licorice and sweet cherry. Yeah. Interesting. Using, uh, well, like a cherry juice, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's what I would do. I would get the maybe a uh, jug of the Newton sweet cherry or, uh, you know, or some other kind of sweet cherry and, and try that and see how that plays against that, that, uh, yeah, don't, don't go that the sweet cherry route. Do, do the tart cherry and, and get your sweetness from the honey. Uh, I think we've talked yeah. about this before. You're gonna get you're gonna get cough syrup if you use sweet cherry. Yeah, the Robitussin. Yeah, yeah, but big time. Part of me wonders if the uh, the that uh, 
the strength of the star anise wouldn't kind of counteract that cough syrup. I mean, I, I think or, sorry, the star anise or, anise or the licorice, um, you know, you, you might end up with something totally undrinkable, um, or the two might kind of balance each other out. See, I well, get nervous when I think about putting licorice into a into a drink because uh, if I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember Geritol, you remember the liquid <laughs> Geritol? Oh yeah, I know JD does. Oh yeah, and to me that always had a licorice yeah. taste to it. And yep. there's a fine line there, but that I would not want to cross over. Uh, yeah. So. If I was going to do a licorice drink, I would have to. I'm I'm thinking a hint of licorice, not not something real bold. Yeah. Well, I know I, I've seen mead recipes out there where people have dropped an anastar or two into them. Uh, the one that comes to mind is the fabled J. Oh, you know the the ancient orange mead. Uh, you know, I mean, you you read, of, you know, about all the different kinds of things that people have added to this particular one. Anise, anise, uh, star anise is one thing that I recall people using. But uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of any other recipes where people have used it. But I know it's been done. Uh, well, actually, I've seen it. Um, Prairie Rose Meter, I think it's out of South Dakota. Uh, I could be wrong on the, the location, but they do a, a star anise. Um, flavored meat, just that's the only flavor that's the uh, the star flavor of the whole brew. Um, I've not had an opportunity to try it, but yeah. I was gonna wow. say, I think that's Susan Rudd, if I'm not mistaken, and I think Susan she's Rudd. out of Fargo, yeah. And I think she she's is. out of Fargo, yeah. That's uh, you're, yeah. you're close, you're you're at least in the Dakotas, just it's just North Dakota, yeah. Well, I was, yeah. Close. I recall Susan. Uh, she was a uh, she was a guest on the uh, on the Got Mead show uh, a few years ago. Um, might be worth contacting her and getting some ideas, uh, and uh, you know, see if she can shed any any light on this. And any other ideas for these holiday or themed meads? We've kind of got. Uh, we've got uh, uh, this watermelon thing for Fourth of July, summertime. Uh, we got this licorice thing going on for for a Halloween thing. Should we be thinking about, uh, you know, we're talking about fermenting time versus aging time as well here. So, I mean, the next seven well, holidays logically are going to be like Thanksgiving. Yeah, Jeff. I Jeff think- sent out an email uh, with this. Trickster Tom, uh, I guess it's okay to make that public, Jeff. Uh, that's okay with you if we talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. It's a little bit rough, but that was my uh, my concept for the blackberry black currant weed. Uh, with the well, I like added. I like what I'm seeing here. Uh, I would make two suggestions. Um, You've got six of the um, peppers in here in secondary. Yep. Uh, I would go with three on that because I did try a, uh, a cherry chipotle, and mm-hmm. I did a five-gallon with three, and it was just right. Uh, and and the okay. problem is not with the heat. The problem is with the smoke. You will overpower it with smoke flavor with six with six peppers. Good to know. I hadn't considered the smoke flavor. Um, how yep. long did you have it on the three? You know, I think I went. I think I went for about three days and and tasted it, and it was about where I wanted it, and I pulled them out. Okay. Uh, but definitely go with three, not six. Um, and, and like I said, it's not the heat; it's the smoke. The smoke will totally overpower everything. Um, and the other thing that I might suggest on this, this is a this really sounds like a good recipe, but what I might do since we're going to end up so much on the dry side, I think you've got a estimation of 10, 10 for a final gravity, um, yeah. and blackberries and currants both can be, uh, 
they're, they're, I mean, they're very acidic and, and the blackberries especially are going to bring a, an earthy acidic acidity to it. Mm-hmm. I might actually go, uh, once this thing is finished, uh, fermentation and I get it and get the, uh, berries. I mean, before I put the peppers in, I might consider putting this thing through a malolactic fermentation to kind of soften that acidity. That could be interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. I would. Yeah, I, I, I would do also that. Also, thought about yeah, just maybe bumping that uh, start in gravity by another ten, fifteen points, so it uh, finishes a little higher. It did occur to me that we're going to be doing dealing with some um, some tannic and some acid issues that uh, might make the dryness a little bit unpalatable. I usually tend to prefer things on the drier side, but um, in this case, yeah, one way or another, we might want to take uh, take some action to deal with that. Yeah, you, and uh, uh, you know, remember your perception here. Uh, this thing could finish at ten thirty, and it's yep. still not going to seem sweet to you. It's still going <laughs> to, it's going to be dry. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but if you did finish at ten ten, uh, you could pull that off. And I think you could put it through a malolactic fermentation and pull that off. Well, I've never tried the malolactic. It'd be a uh, an interesting thing to do, if only for the experience of doing it. For uh, for the benefit of listeners who've never heard of that either, uh, what is that, Chris? <laughs> well, it, it's just a, a bacteria culture that that's added after primary, and uh, it will it'll soften some of the acidity. It'll change the uh, the malic acid into a into lactic acid, which is a smoother and milder acid. Yeah. Um, so, what if you What if you use uh, Yeah, because I, I sometimes I have a thing with blackberries too. Uh, you know, there's there are some there there's there's some berries out there that they're just not sweet. Uh, you know, when you get especially when you get them out of the store because they're always picked too damn early anyway, but. They're not sweet until you put something sweet with it, like sugar or honey. Blackberries is one of them. Raspberries is another one. Uh, raspberries by themselves taste like crap. But if you put sugar with the raspberries, it tastes awesome. Um, so what if, what if you use like a blackberry juice or blackberry puree? Would you accomplish the same flavor pro- profile, you think? Or, or how, how would that work? Well, and you're really my... My freeze and thaw cycle process when I'm working with fruit, uh, at least the, the few millimoles I've done this year, um, you know, I've, I've tried the lulzyme that Chris uh, recommended with my pumpkin thing, and um, that kind of put me off of it for a while. But I've had pretty good results with just freezing and thawing a few times to really break down those cell walls. Um, you know, you smush them up a little bit with your hands when it's all said and done, and you get a pretty, uh, not quite pureed, but pretty well, like, smooshed up result yeah. from that um i i don't know if i'd want to use a commercial puree just because i worried that the mechanical process of pureeing those would expose or like potentially crack the seeds which would introduce a lot more tannin um that i wonder if we, they uh don't they filter the seeds out i wonder you got to wonder at what point they do that though yeah if, if that's true that's uh before they, they smush things up or uh, as they're smushing things up, I'm, you know, I have no idea. I don't know yeah. how that mechanical process works. Um, the juice is kind of along the same lines, although I, I did honestly think about just throwing in a can of the Vintner's Harvest, like 96 ounce blackberry yeah. juice, calling it good. Um, and I still might. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I want to go to Target and buy a nine to 12, um, uh, one pound bags of frozen blackberries to make this happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've done it many times. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, and I, you know, I don't want to buy a ninety-six ounce can of blackberry puree just to take a taste of it and see if I want to use it either. To, yeah, uh, that's a, a tricky situation too. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I like this. Uh, uh, I dig this recipe, man. Uh, yeah. And the other thing I'm worried about is just the essentially the black currant, um, that tartness from that kind of overpowering everything else. So I'm a little bit wary as to whether I want to use like a quart of the juice or a pint of the juice. I may just start with the pint and primary and 
decide if I need a second pint uh, when it gets to secondary um, based on how it's doing then. Um, now, I think you'll be okay with a quart in six gallons. And and I'm basing that entirely on my heart murmur recipe. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think I think a quart in six. Now, if you were doing less than six gallons, I would probably back down. But I think you'll be okay in six gallons there. Um, you're totally. I wonder. Uh, you're talking about smoking these these. The tournament of Chipotle's. I wonder if you use what's that? What's that other chili? Oh God! Just uh, come on, guys. They come dry. Uh, they're red. They're big. You rehydrate them. Always uh, typically used in sauces. Uh, you put them in a blender, grind them up, add garlic, onions, spices, and whatnot. Come on. What are those chilies called? Oh. Uh, Oh God, dang! Uh, Sorry, know, the, they're they're real big. Uh, yeah, they're real big. They're dried. Ancho, ancho chilies. Uh, yeah, ancho chilies. Ancho I wonder chilies. if uh, would you accomplish uh, the same thing because they're uh, they've got a smoky flavor, um, and uh, of course, I mean you don't, you'd have to kind of guess at how many you'd need because you have to rehydrate them. Yeah. Uh, but I wonder if that's the I, same. Are you looking for the heat? Uh, I'm looking for a little bit of the the heat, a little bit of the smoky flavor. Uh, yeah. My the the concept of the mouthfeel or the experience of drinking this, uh, I want that uh, that fruit flavor to be very like on the nose and um, across the the tongue when you're when you're first drinking it. And my my concept of that heat. And the smoky flavor is that that's going to hit you on the the aftertaste, or as you're kind of swallowing, and it's kind of kind of be that little that last little punch that says, "Hey, uh, yeah, no, that that's not all pleasant. There's a little yeah. bit of burn there too." So if you, Re, uh, if you... remember our uh, remember our conversation about um, oxidative and reductive fermentations, yeah, um, take this thing when you if you're going to put this together and do an open fermentation for um, like the first, I don't know, maybe five days or so, or mm-hmm. up until the point where you do your final uh, degassing and yep. then airlock it. And that'll help bring some of that fruit up on the nose like you're wanting. Okay. Well, I'll take that, uh, take that advice, sure. I want to go back to these. Uh, I want to go back to the chili peppers here for a minute. What you know, uh, not a lot. Not everybody's going to be able to cold smoke uh, these jalapenos. Now, yeah, no. I always uh, I make my chipotles on my on my gas stove. I've got one of these, uh, uh, you know, only seen on TV metal sta- uh, st- uh, uh, steamer basket things. Uh, and I open it up, I just put it right on the burner and crank the burner all the way up, and I lay my chilies out on that. Uh, I wonder if you can do the same thing. Uh, just roast your chilies, uh, leave the skin on uh, to get that that smoky flavor uh, and use them that way rather than trying to go through this whole thing about cold smoking, uh, you know, a, a rack of chili uh, jalapenos. Well, and that's that's not far off from one approach I was considering, depending on uh, whether or not I can get somebody with a, a true dedicated smoker to uh, to give me a hand with this. Because um, I, you know, I have a fairly large just gas grill in my my backyard, uh, and it occurred to me if I take like a quarter size little pan, throw some um, some wet wood chips of the appropriate variety on one far side, and uh, line out my chilies on the other side. Um, well, you know, it yeah, be a cold smoke, but it would be a fairly, uh, all, all, all you need is a, a all you need is a cake pan, a cake rack and some foil. Uh, and Ooh. you put your, you put your wood chips on the bottom of the pan, put the cake, the cake rack on top with your chilies and then put the foil over the top and set that on top of your, on top of your burner. Uh, sure. it's the same, if, the same thing they do in a restaurant. If you've ever cooked meat in that grill, don't do it. I'm telling you. Oh, that's <laughs> you true. Remember what yeah. I told you? Remember yeah. what I told you that happened to me? I tried to make uh, 
tried to make those in my in my barbecue smoker, and they had a layer of grease on them. <laughs> yeah. <Whoa. laughs> uh, yeah. The uh, Good call. And, you know, and I didn't have the heat cranked up at all, but that that uh, the grease and the oil will will vaporize, and and they will over the course of you know the twelve or fourteen hours that it takes to to dry those things out, they will be completely soggy with, with grease. So, yeah, yeah. uh, that rules out anything that's had meat cooked in it. It won't work. Damn. That kind of rules out most everybody I know with a smoker. Cause there, there is no way I yeah. know anybody with a virgin smoker around here. So well, maybe like we'll I go say, back to boy scouts for that. Well, you, like I say, yeah. you, you, you don't need, you don't need a big fancy smoker. You can do it in your kitchen just turn the fire the, the fire alarms off, uh, and uh, because this, I'm telling you, this this is the way they do this in restaurants, and although they use a specific pan made for doing this, but you just simply take a cake pan, and if you've got a cake rack, uh, you know, like a like a cooling rack, uh, yep. cookie cookie rack or whatever, uh, that'll fit inside the cake pan. Uh, you put your wood chips, your wet chips on the bottom, prop. Prop that that cookie rack up a little bit off the wood chips. Uh, put your put your chilies on that and cover it with foil, and put it on top of the stove. And uh, when it starts smoking, <laughs> uh, you got you got it. So okay. uh, you know, so What's you don't you, yeah you you don't have to use uh, you know a nice big fancy uh, backyard smoker. Uh, you know, but be be advised, uh, it's gonna fill your house with smoke. <laughs> you know what though? On the topic of backyard smokers, I don't have a smoker. I do have a turkey fryer, and while I'm sure that's been used to uh, to heat up a vessel which contained meat, I think the burner itself is clear of any kind of grease or debris. So I might just toss it on that burner and uh, let it go to town that way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or if you can get a metal container, uh, something that's not galvanized. Most trash cans are galvanized, but if you could find one that's not, um, you could you could put that on the burner and smoke in that. Cover it with a, with some tin foil. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to play around with that a little bit. See what I come up with. The Boy Scout in you should <laughs> should come up with something there. Yeah, there's. <laughs> There, there's enough Boy Scout and just you know yeah, backyard uh, drunken innovation and boredom that I I can come up with something. I'm definitely sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, See, okay. I ruined I ruined about three pounds of jalapenos on my smoker by doing that, and uh, so I learned the hard way. <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll learn from your mistake there. <laughs> so um i'm gonna put uh and aaron, aaron if you want to send me your your little concoction uh for the watermelon uh and uh chris if you if, if you got some time and can put something together uh you know even just if it's just a three gallon thing for this licorice thing and then jeff i'm gonna put these all up on the website but let people know that hey these recipes these are totally uh, experimental, uh, and uh, you know, here you go. Uh, you know, here's here's this uh, here's this recipe you can you can try out, uh, and um, you know, hey, if you do it, please give us a call, shoot us an email or whatever, and uh, you know, let us know uh, you know if you've came up with anything different, if you had any success, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and if you guys have had ideas we haven't thought of, let us know. I mean, we're always open to more input, too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and like I said at the top of the show, uh, since we're not going to be doing the live show anymore, uh, we're going to focus on the podcast part of it. Uh, You can still call the show uh, because our our recording schedule has not changed. We're still on the 6 and 2. We're still live, uh, doing live recording at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so, uh, you know, give us a call, uh, and, and let us know, uh, the number is, uh, well, I mean, I'll post, I'll repost the number cause I changed the header on the website, but, uh, um, let's move on guys. Uh, I know Chris, Chris has had a hell of a week. Um, he was going to come up with a, a list of descriptors, uh, 
uh, with Jeff's input. I know, Jeff, you said at the top of the uh, show here that you had uh, uh, some information on, or no, I guess that was the toxic stuff. Yeah, uh, that was toxic. Yeah, and I, you were going to provide a little bit of input with Chris on these descriptors. Uh, I kind of wanted to touch on that a little bit if we could, maybe based on your uh, experience as, as a meat judge, uh, coming from that perspective. Uh, I wanted to kind of touch on that before we got into Aaron's uh, hop evaluation. So sure. um, can you can you tell us uh, what kind of a list or, or – words or things that uh, we should be thinking about as far as descriptors? Okay, well... Um, me or, me or so, oh, Jeff, okay. Well, either one of you. I know, I, I know, Chris, you said that you had a pretty busy week and weren't really able to do a whole lot of stuff, or did you have well, a list? I, I, had this list? I had this list ready for last week, but Jeff, oh, okay. go, ahead with what you, go ahead with what you've got, and I'll, uh, I'll throw in what I've got afterwards. You know, you, we may be better off going the other way around because I don't have a lot. Uh, I will say, you know, there are a, a number of common um, faults that, you know, you share between uh, anything fermented, whether it's a, a, a wine or a, um, um, a mead, a beer, cider, uh, anything that, that uh, Saccharomyces has had a, a hand in um, has the potential to, to uh, get these faults. Um, the, uh, the biggest ones are uh, things like uh, a bacterial infection, and that can take a, a number of different forms. Um, you can get a skunky smell off of that. You can get a kind of a, uh, um, a, a weird, uh, oh, there, there are a number of different ways that manifests. Um, but a, a large number of the faults are also from essentially a stress fermentation. Um, so, uh, okay. they, one of the, one of the most common ones that I know of is uh, um, it's kind of that that movie theater buttery uh, popcorn taste. Um, and uh, the name escapes me at the moment uh, from what causes that. But that's a stressed yeast um, byproduct, essentially. Um, an, another one is kind of the uh, the acid aldehyde, um, which is that that really the the kind of the sour green apple taste. Um, so, yeah, beyond that, um, the, the other things you want to think about are just essentially the, the flavors and the, uh, the aromas that you would expect to, to, to sample in a meat. I mean, um, you want to look for the full side. Yeah. Uh, dimethyl sulfide is, <laughs> well, <laughs> um, suicide. That's that. <laughs> what? What, what you did you say? That, did you? Yeah, I caught it. What did you say? I, Something suicide. I caught it after the fact, yeah. Well, we were talking <laughs> back and forth on something entirely different a couple of weeks back, um, and I, I mentioned that, you know, stuff that can be a fault in some recipes, um, in in other, um, in, in some categories, is actually, like, really true to style. My example was that, uh, you know, if you if you read the, the BJCP descriptor for a, a Czech Pilsner, um, the, the dimethyl dimethyl sulfide which is kind of a it's a it's like a cooked corn or a cream corn flavor um well i like uh, cream corn <laughs> that's actually considered a fault according to the oh bjc <laughs> but um if you drink a czech pilsner in the czech republic that's actually made there and has been made there for you know four or five centuries um a little bit of dms the dimethyl sulfide that's not only okay it's kind of like expected uh, oh, wow. it, it it feels weird if it's not there, and you know my my uh, texting on my phone or my emailing on my phone uh, for whatever reason swipe corrected my sulfide to uh, suicide. So oh, that's that, where that came from. Yep, that was that. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, that's how the whole uh, discussion about <laughs> what the cults drank when they went to meet the aliens on the comet or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Uh, okay. So what, uh, what what kind of a list did you have together there, Chris? Well, I wasn't really focusing on, on faults. I was just looking for descriptor words uh, for people who are wanting to, uh, like what we're going to do with Aaron's Mead tonight, we were going to sort of evaluate it. 
and so, uh, you know, some words that, that are common descriptors of what you might be tasting, um, and it, and these apply to aroma and, and flavor also, uh, but, you know, things like an earthy, and, and in the earthy category, you've got dirt, you've got green grass, you've got hay, barnyard, uh, all those kinds of words like that. Then you got in what I would say the fruit category, uh, you can smell or taste a, uh, a jammy type flavor, um, fruity, dark fruit, stone fruit, um, citrus fruit, tropical fruit. Um, and then you've got other things like tobacco and you know, I hear a lot of things that have stone, dark stone fruit in them can be described as having a, a tobacco aroma to them. Um, you've also got things like um, malty and uh, all your common spices that you put in, uh, whether it, it's some people will just say it smells peppery, it, spe- it smells spicy it it uh, has a uh even the alcohol has a sometimes is described as being somewhat of a spicy flavor um boozy all of these words are things that that describe mostly melomales i think in in general but uh, they could apply to anything chocolate somebody's yawning <laughs> yeah ryan's bored Right? <laughs> Are you awake, Ryan? <laughs> that had nothing to do with you, Chris. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry, I thought I was on mute. <laughs> I actually have my Bob Ross uh, T-shirt on, and he does the same thing to me. Uh-oh. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, when I was tasting, uh, you know, where I first picked up on a lot of these descriptors, I'm listening to Liquor Hound. If you go to YouTube, if you anything you ever wanted to know about liquor, uh, go to YouTube Hound. He does some amazing reviews on virtually all, just every spirit known to man. Uh, and I, I paid particular attention to his his bourbons, and uh, he starts talking about uh, the very things you're talking about, Chris, like leather, uh, tobacco, uh, of course, the oaks, and yeah, and, and there's a whole different spread on oaks, too. Uh, there's the light mm-hmm. oaks, American oaks, French oaks. They all impart different uh, aromas and flavors. Uh, you know, vanilla, uh, orange peel, uh, all different kinds of descriptors, and I started tasting my bourbon and started looking for those. And, and it's funny because I never, I never considered leather, echo, as any kind of a description in how I tasted my bourbon until I saw this guy talking about it. And they start popping into your mind. You know, as I taste these different bourbons that I have, I can pick these these aromas and these flavors out. It's pretty amazing. So, yeah, I'm not real good at picking out some of the more subtle things because my palate's just not sensitive enough. But, um, you know, there are certain things that that pop out to me. One of the things was green apple. Uh, when it comes to tasting honey, uh. I I always knew that honey had this certain, or at least some honeys, have this certain tang, uh, and uh, and it's mostly like going down your throat. It's got a tang on the back end, and I never really knew how to describe it until I heard someone talking about this green apple character. And think about that the next time you have sort of a, a tangy, tart honey. It really is like a Granny Smith apple. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, you know, along that line, we really don't, we as a society don't think about honey as being acidic or having an acid content to it because it's so sweet. 
but you know, once you know you fermented that out and you're you're leaving just the uh, the non sugar stuff behind, there's definitely acid components to honey, and um, you know it, you really only see that when you're fermenting out the sweetness. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. So true. And, you know, some are some are more than others, like the basswood. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, basswood is loaded with acid. That's where that's coming from. Okay. That makes that right there makes sense uh, because mm-hmm. that part that part of our next discussion I didn't know, but it makes all the sense in the world now. Um, let's uh, why don't we just go ahead and uh, if you haven't popped the tops on your let's see what are we doing crystal right crystal mm-hmm. oh Alexa I wasn't talking to you um, the uh, um okay so uh Aaron uh Aaron why don't you explain uh, what you did here Absolutely So for those listeners that have been listening for a while you guys know I'm a, a huge hop head I love IPAs and you know really strongly hopped beers and I, I wanted to do an experiment that would allow me to just get more familiar and, and better understand some of the different hop varieties that are out there, particularly used in like a dry, lighter bodied, lighter alcohol, more of like a session strength mead. Um, so this is an experiment I put together last summer, which was to compare three uniquely different hop varieties that, you know, in doing some research on these had three different types of flavor profiles. Um, I don't want to maybe tell you guys which one this crystal one is, or you you may already know, uh, but just for the sake of setting up the experiment, one of the hops was described as being more of like piney, resiny. The other one was more citrusy and fruity. And the last one was described as being more of a floral, spicy type of a flavor. Um, and in, in terms of the recipes here, these were each three one-gallon batches. And actually, I, I have to credit Jeff for contributing significantly and, and really, you know, guiding me through through the process here. So the procedure that I used you know, largely comes from Jeff. Uh, what he had recommended is for each of these batches, I boiled a quart of water and added, I think in total, a half ounce of these three different hops. Um, I boiled them for, I think, 30 minutes total, but I did kind of like a staggered addition throughout the boil. Um, so a quarter of the ounce is boiled for the, the full 30 minutes an eighth of the ounce, uh, an eighth ounce of the hops boiled for um, the final ten minutes, and then at the very end, for the last two minutes, I added another eighth ounce of hops, kind of mirror, mirroring that after you know your hop additions during the beer brewing process, where you get you know the the flavoring, the bitter, is it, or is it the bittering, the flavoring, and, and the aroma hops. Right. Yeah. Um, so from there, I, I mixed in enough basswood honey to raise the starting gravity up to 1.078. Um, this was 19 bricks using my refractometer. Um, and in, in my notes, I had recorded that was just about two pounds per gallon. Um, and because, you know, if I'm using hops, which was more of a, a beer ingredient, I wanted to go for more of a beer profile in these, so I, I elected to use an ale yeast, the Cephal US 05. Um, then from there, you know, I, I really just followed kind of my standard protocol, rehydrating that yeast with the GoFirm Energy, using the, the Firm 8 and the Tazna nutrient schedule. Um, and uh, I, looking at my notes, I don't have an exact brew date on these, but I think it was sometime around May of 2016. And um, these went into the bottle in December of 2016, so about three months or so ago. Um, they are bottle conditioned, um, although I'm on this first crystal one, I, I think um, for one reason or another, it didn't 
this one didn't fully carve up quite like the the other ones did, but that's just a, a little bit of the background on on this experiment here. Again, just to to kind of compare these three different hops, um, and kind of the the objective for me was to kind of better understand the the different flavors you can get from different hops and see if there's one type of hop that kind of played better in in the mead versus the others. And you sent out a, um, you emailed us this uh, score sheet, just uh, for each one, uh, the uh, Crystal, the Chinook, and the Calypso. And uh, first up uh, tonight, we all agreed, was going to be the Crystal. I'll go ahead and start this off. And I filled out this sheet today when I was uh, tasting your, your mead. And the first box is appearance, uh, comment on color, clarity, uh, legs, and carbonation. Um, it was, it was clear. It was a little bit foggy, but it was nice and clear. Um, and, uh, I really don't care about the clarity. Um, I'm kind of over that. I used to think that, you know, gosh, it's, it needs to be absolutely crystal clear. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of past that. Good carbonation. Um, I I don't typically look at at wines or or beers or anything with you know that with with the leg thing. I, I call it smear. <laughs> if it smears the <laughs> if it smears the glass really good, uh, then you know I guess that means something. That I know it's not going to be real watery. Uh, so it had a nice smear. Um, the bouquet um, and aroma, uh, you wanted to know about the uh, the honey expression, the alcohol, hop aroma, esters, so on and so forth. What I got from this uh, from the crystal was a very light honey aroma from this one. Um, I got kind of a lemony uh, aroma as well. I don't know where that's coming from. Um, but definitely, yeah, definitely got the honey part, uh, but it was very light, a lot lighter than the other one that I had this morning. Uh, oh, did we lose somebody? Oh, we lost Ryan. Uh, let me get Ryan back. He went to sleep. You know, JD, while you're oh. pulling back him, pulling him back in, uh, just a, a couple other comments about this score sheet. So I, this is actually the second revision of this score sheet that, that I sent around. I, I sent out a first draft to the group, got some real good feedback. I, I forget who it was, but someone suggested that, um, you know, I, I reference the BJCP mead evaluation form. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that's where a lot of, the format of this came from in terms of, you know, comment on the the appearance and the bouquet and the aroma and the flavor and um, overall impression. You know, these are all elements that I kind of borrowed from that BJCP score sheet. Yeah. Right. Well, Ryan, Ryan, grab something to write with because I don't have access to mine right now. So I'm going to give you my, my, do you want me to take the notes? I, yeah. I'll, I'll grab them. I'll grab them. I, I'm going to be consolidating it. Um, anyway, so uh, I did, did I say Ryan? I meant Aaron. Aaron, yeah. Um, in the um, also in the bouquet, the I didn't get a whole lot of hop aroma out of out of the uh, crystal. Um, it was uh, the aroma I did get was very slight, very light. Uh, there's the uh, the flavor box. Now here you wanted to comment on the honey, the hop character, the sweetness, acidity, acidity, tannin, so on and so forth. Balance, body, carbonation, aftertaste. Uh, I got that box pretty well filled in. Um, I wrote down floral. I wrote down light hint of black pepper. I also wrote down carbonated Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, white grape, uh, white wine grape. I wrote down nice body, tannin with a question mark, uh, and uh, maybe maybe very light tannin is what I got. 
Uh, I wrote down a lingering pepper aftertaste, uh, very slight, black pepper type, uh, and then a citrus acid. And uh, Chris's comment about the basswood uh, uh, being a rather acidic honey, or maybe it was uh, Jeff, uh, perhaps that's where that's coming from. And then I also in the in the in, on on the margin I wrote down perceived sweetness because I really didn't get any any sweetness, but there's something there uh, that told my mind that uh, about the middle about the middle there was something sweet that I was tasting. Uh, and the overall impression I thought it was a bit bland for my taste. Now that's purely my own taste. Uh, not a whole lot of flavor uh, that I would have liked, uh, but it did have a good body, nice mouthfeel, dry, uh, and again, this perceived sweetness uh, uh, almost on the finish even, from the middle to about the finish. Um, and the rank, uh, right now I've got it number two because I already have uh, a number one out of the two that I tried today. So those those are my notes, and then the check or I don't I don't know if this is a checkbox or or what. Over on the right, you've got descriptors. Uh, I marked down floral. I marked I, I put a check mark in grapefruit, and uh, and in black pepper, and uh, those are my notes. That's awesome. Okay. Well, thank, thanks, JD. That's uh, that's interesting. I'm I'm just fascinated to hear your thoughts on this. So, Aaron, I've got this right here uh, ready to go if you want to take this down. Uh, I'm not going ready to, be able to, go. to rank it because this is my first one. So, uh, appearance, yeah, it's a little bit cloudy, uh, which doesn't matter at all. Uh, very light carbonation, no head, uh, no legs. Um, the aroma... Lots of grapefruit, big time grapefruit. Um, it's been warming up just a little bit here, and as it warms up, there's there's a lot of honey coming through. Not much when it's cold, but uh, to be such a light beverage, there's a lot of honey coming through, and it almost has. If you inhale really, really deeply. There is uh, almost a vanilla character in the nose and slight medicinal aroma. Mm. Flavor. Um, Starts out big time grapefruit again. Maybe like some orange peel in there. Very citrusy all over, all around. I'm not sure if that's coming from the hops or or the basswood honey, though. I don't really... I'm not really picking up hop so much as I am honey. Um, slight medicinal taste. Uh... Maybe some. I, I gotta agree with JD. There's a little bit of a sort of a Chardonnay white grape in there. Um, maybe a tiny bit of floral in the background, but it's very slight. Light bodied. Uh, it's actually got a little bit more mouthfeel and body to it than you would think. Uh, as it's like on the mid palate. Which that's where I think JD also was noticing some of that perceived sweetness. So it, it's interesting kind of what's going on there in, in the middle. Yeah. And I know this is bone dry, but it doesn't, it doesn't come off as being just searingly dry. It's not the kind of thing that would, really leave your palate feeling dry. Um, overall impression, I would say this is definitely what I would consider a very uh, citrusy 
citrusy kind of uh, kind of mead. Uh, maybe it's just a tad bit medicinal, um, which may be from uh, it may be from the honey, it may be from the hops, it may be from. Uh, I don't think it's from the alcohol because I don't really pick up on the alcohol that much. If that's coming from alcohol, I would say it's a spiciness. Maybe um, JD mentioned black pepper. I get more of a white pepper kind of note from it. So overall, it's a it's a good session mead. Uh, only thing that I would like probably is a little bit more carbonation. Excellent. That's about I will. It that's awesome. This is, I, I'm just really enjoying listening to you guys' thoughts on this. So thanks for the feedback and uh, interested to, to hear Jeff and Ryan's take on this too. Maybe before jumping in there, I, I, I think this will make for a really interesting article to, to, to put out on the website and um, hopefully is, is equally as interesting to our listeners to be learning about these three different hops. Well, I, I think the lesson here is, and this goes back to to uh, Aaron, or to um, Chris and uh, Jeff, you know, talking about these description words and this kind of thing, is being able to self-evaluate your mead or beer or whatever. Uh, and I think this is a good uh, hands-on opportunity to be able to think about these words because – Going back to what I said about the bourbon, I never approached mead like this, ever. <laughs> okay, so this is a good lesson. So, uh, Aaron, Aaron, I would also add that once you stop drinking it, that grapefruit slowly fades into a perfumey type flavor. Okay, so it, it leaves a leaves a little bit of a of a perfume aftertaste which is not a bad thing i could see that i could see that for sure who's next jeff go ahead jeff. okay go ahead jeff sure um so uh just going down the the list here as far as appearance goes um color is a really light straw it's a nice um you know what i would expect out of a dry mead I did get a little bit of a chill haze uh, when I first poured it, but now that it's warmed up a little bit, um, it is almost crystal clear. Um, like JD mentioned, it doesn't have legs. Um, legs is something you really expect more from a wine instead of a session spring. Then this really sheets off the glass pretty easily. Um, carbonation level, it sounds like mine is a little less carbonated than you guys. This is what I would call a uh, petalant mead, where um, it, it's not still. You know, if I disturb the glass, it will kick up some bubbles, but there's not like that that shower of bubbles creating a head that you would get from a carbonated beverage. Um, okay, so as far as bouquet goes, um, when I'm when I'm smelling it here, I'm getting um, it, it's almost a marriage of the honey and the hop aroma. The hop aroma, um, like. The other guys have commented on it. It gives it this kind of a perceived sweetness. And I think if I'm not mistaken, this is going to be the floral hop. Um, the, it, I, I, I smell honey and I smell something sweet, but I know this is dry. So it can't be exactly the honey by itself. Uh, it has to be contributing from the hops, but it's not something I would consider. You know, when I think of hops, I think of an IPA, which is really, really strong, uh, or really bitter. It's not that smell at all. Um, I'm not getting a lot of alcohol. I'm not getting a lot of esters, but this is a lower alcohol mead. Those necessarily wouldn't be uh, be terribly uh, present here. Um, as far as flavor goes, um, yeah, I, it's an, an, a really nice um, light flavor. There's there's some honey expression. There's that sweetness along the middle that comes I wholeheartedly believe from the hops itself and their interaction with the honey um, and it has it has a bite at the end that's um, it's acidic enough that I, I, I want to call it almost crisp but not quite crisp um, it, it, it's missing the tannin part to maybe really be 
like a good crisp apple cider, but it's got that that acid bite associated with it that it is still really pleasant for the end of the drink. Um, as far as flavors go, um, what I'm what I'm getting more than anything outside of the uh, that, that slight acidity from the honey um, is really more of like it's it, it's landing on my palate somewhere between like a really light lemon flavor and maybe like a spruce tip flavor. Um, the I, I I think what uh, JD and uh, Chris had mentioned as kind of a peppery flavor um, is, is kind of that acid bite that I'm getting. Um, Cause I, I could see where they're coming from with that. It, it's, it's registered to me. It's just, you know, a, that kind of that acid character from the, uh, the basswood honey. Um, it, it's a light bodied mead, but it's supposed to be, and I don't fault you for that at all. I think it's really pleasant. Um, I, I agree with Chris. I would like it a little bit more carbonated. Um, but as far as an overall impression goes, I mean, I taste this and I think, man, uh, this summer when I'm mowing the lawn, it's hot and I'm sweaty and nasty. I want to have like two of these on ice so that I can sit in the hammock, crack them open and just finish these off when I'm done. Um, the, the only room for improvement, I would say maybe a little bit more expression from the honey and maybe a little bit more expression from the hops. But otherwise, it's a really pleasant drink. <laughs> Awesome. Well, and Jeff, just want to thank you as well for your input to the procedure and the recipe. You know, your your comments and, and guidance leading me into this was just a, a crucial part to it. So oh, definitely appreciate the feedback and your input in, in crafting this recipe. I guess that leaves me. Um, just a couple of a couple of questions that I think I might have missed earlier. What was the um, final gravity on this guy? So all of these wound up pretty bone dry between like 0.999 and just one zero zero zero. And and what did uh, what did that put us at for ABV? Oh gosh, okay. So let me do some quick math on that. But nineteen bricks. Potential alcohol. I should know this. Well, does that's got to be about nine? Pre- yeah, it's got to be just under ten. You know, I was so, just I mean, I'd, comment when Jeff said he would like to have this a couple of these. I've got a feeling this would hit you pretty hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So how? <laughs> This is saying 10.8. Is that right? Yeah. That's about that's, right. Yeah. 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 10, oh, wow. It's almost 11. Okay. Well, um, you know, maybe I wouldn't be getting up from that hammock too soon. <laughs> that might not now, be a what, bad thing. <laughs> what, uh, what was your procedure for um, the bottle conditioning? or the, the, I guess adding the priming sugar. Right? What did you do to carbonate it? So basically your usual five ounces that would go in a full five-gallon batch, divided that by five for a single gallon. Um, What is it, usually a a pint or so of of water that you would boil that in, just divided that by five as well. Basically, I, I took the usual procedure I would follow for bottle conditioning a five gallon batch of beer and divided by five. Okay. Did you so? Did you bottle it out of your uh, a bottling bucket or a or your one gallon jug or what did you do there? Bottling bucket. Bottling bucket. Okay. And okay. Um, well, one of the first things that that stuck out, uh, yeah, stuck out when when everyone was talking, is that my it, it seems like we all got slightly different versions of the batch. And like Jeff, uh, mine was um, petulant uh, in that it, there's just very, very, very light carbonation. Um, and there was absolutely no sediment at on the bottom of the bottle that I got. Um, you know, I, 
when I bottle conditioned beers and I bottle conditioned meads and, and made, you know, um, you know, sparkling wines that I've bottle conditioned, you know, I generally, you'll get that, that layer of, of tight, you know, or sediment on the bottom. Um, and, and like, uh, um, Chris was saying, you know, and maybe he was rough with it or maybe it just, it didn't settle out, but his kind of came out hazy. Um, mine was, uh, brilliantly clear. I mean, I mean, it's, it's like you almost ran it through a filter to get it as clear as it was. So I, I don't know if that's because it wasn't all the priming sugar wasn't mixed in thoroughly to the batch to give all of the, the, the entire batch, the same, roughly the same uh, amount of priming sugar, but mine was just ever so slightly carbonated. And like I said, it was brilliantly clear. Um, I actually put my color as, um, as a, a light golden and because it's, it is, it's, it's almost like the way that you'd see a very, very light colored gold that's, you know, brilliantly polished. And, and I'm going to use that word polished again, because this, that's how I think of wines that have been put through a filter is that they're very, very polished. And this, this one to me looked practically polished, um, as I poured it into the glass. Um, I also served mine at, uh, between 60 and 65 degrees, uh, because I did want to make sure that I wasn't burying any of the aromas or flavors, um, in, in too cool of a temperature. So I served it at just under room temperature, which, um, you know, really exposes it to, to everything. And there's, there's not a lot of places to hide when you do it at that temperature. Um, so it's a light golden color, brilliantly clear, ever so slight carbonation. Uh, that'd be the appearance box. Moving down to the bouquet uh, aroma um, there, I, I said it was very, I got very light, very bright fruit. Um, so one of the things that I do to really... Um, really get a good smell as you know I stick my nose deep into the glass and I take a few big breaths and then I I kind of pull back and then um I, I let it let, let rest for a few minutes you know you've got the little um little bits of aroma on your on your uh, nasal receptors at that point uh and then I go back in and I take I take a few more uh whiffs and, and you can get some little bit of differences there. I picked up, um, no different than anybody else. A lot of grapefruit. I picked up a lot of grapefruit. Um, I picked up some very slight peach and I also picked up, um, uh, a little bit of lemon, maybe even lemon zest is how I would describe it. Um, and then, uh, going into the flavor, uh, I got a little, I got, I got some, um, medium, I guess a medium mouthfeel, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't big and rich and felt like it coated your mouth, but it also at the same time didn't, it was definitely not watery or, um, thin by any means. Um, you, you know, I, same type of thing, perceived sweetness, uh, just, just ever so, uh, it's like you see it, you want to know it's there. Uh, we talked about that watermelon Jolly Rancher. The watermelon Jolly Rancher tastes nothing like a watermelon. It's just it's the color of a watermelon. It's the it says watermelon on it, and you convince yourself that that's what watermelon candy tastes like, or what a water, watermelon should taste like. Um, in the, so the same thing, you know, you see a, a white wine, it's dry, but it, you get a little bit of that sweetness that, that's coming through there. Um, I did get um, quite a bit of acidity uh, coming from it. Um, and and then I got, I definitely picked up that, and I I almost call it a residual bitterness when you dry hop because there's, you've got to leave it. It's got to dry out for quite a long time before it picks up any measurable IBU. But at the same time, you can pick up these, 
this this bitterness uh, perception um, uh, from the dry hopping, and that that's definitely what I picked up. Um, this I thought that going to the overall impression uh, for any of you non non beer makers out there, there is a type of brew called a smash beer. Uh, and, and what smash is an acronym and it stands for single malt, single hop. And it's a way for brewers, uh, to really learn their ingredients, learn what that single hop does and learn what that single malt does. And, and, and you can, you can make a lot of great beers that way, number one, but it also just really helps you, um, learn your ingredients. And then, you know, most beers are, you start blending a little bit, maybe some, some hops, some malts. Um, and in some ways they, the smash beers are, they feel a little bit incomplete. And my perception here is that, uh, it, it's like a smash mead, you know, and that it's, it's this single honey, single hop. It's an amazing way to learn what the ingredients do with each other. What is, what does this honey do with this hop? You know, what, what can we learn from them? Um, and, and for that, I think it's absolutely great. Um, it's, I, I think that if, if I were to try to make a commercial variety of this, um, you know, you might not keep it as a smash. You might, you might do some blending, maybe some blending of this honey, some blending at the hops. Um, uh, for me, I thought that, uh, just, just a touch, just a touch of sweetness, um, would balance out, against some of the acidity and the and the bitterness and give it that that really really drinkable um you know or or now i'm saying smashable but i I don't mean acronym smash i mean you know drinking smash uh smashable quality to it that that jeff was talking about as his his lawnmower mead but at the same time i'm also drinking it at room temperature where i'll bet you that if i dropped a few ice cubes in this and it muted some of the acidity and it muted some of the bitterness um i could just skull it and it would and it would just go down very smooth, very nice, and it would just be extremely pleasant to drink overall. Um, so, so just I guess to sum up, is I I thought overall it's a excellent effort. It's a it's a wonderful learning experience, and um, because this is the first one that I've also had, I don't I don't have a rank next to it yet. Awesome. Well, thank did you, you so much. Did, did is, you uh, get all that, Aaron? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I may have to uh, go back and put this episode on repeat a couple of yeah. times when uh, yeah. when I'm putting the pen to the paper here. But this I, is, I'm, this is excellent. I'm sending all my stuff to Ryan from right from now <laughs> on to, to get good input. Uh, <laughs> my my overall impression of this one, though, uh, above all else, I would just say this is grapefruit. From for me, it's grapefruit through and through. Interesting how Ryan, uh, you know, and I've heard Ryan uh, say this before that he always, you know, first time out, he'll try it at room temperature to get the true, I don't know, true feel about it or, or, or undisturbed, uh, you know, because mine, mine was right out of the refrigerator and, uh, you know, it was probably uh, 40 degrees or below. Uh, so it was ice cold, uh, when I drank it and, uh, Listening to Ryan, uh, my, what a difference in, uh, because I'm looking in my notes as he's talking, I'm going, man, I didn't get that. <laughs> so it's pretty amazing just just what the temperature does. Uh, and when, uh, you know, I, I heard uh, Jeff and, and Ryan talk about the carbonation, they almost sounded like they were drinking something different than what I was, that what me and Chris were drinking. I thought it had a lot of carbonation, uh, uh, to it, uh, when I first drank it. And, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 and I don't know whether, uh, it has something to do with temperature, Ryan, you know, when, when it sits at, if you left it out at that temperature, uh, whether the carbonation goes away, uh, I have no idea, but uh, uh, interesting. My, my how, combination uh, level here was was what I would consider perfect for a cider. 
it was yeah, yeah, it wasn't real heavy, but it was there. It had oh, a yeah. good hiss when I popped the top. Yeah, yeah, and I saw, I saw. I mean, you know, the the bubbles rising off the bottom of my glass uh, as I sat here at my desk and and drank it. Um, you know, so uh, uh, but very interesting, Aaron. Are, uh, are you pleased with the? Uh, uh, with the rundown here from the from the guys, very pleased, very pleased. No, I, I've just thoroughly enjoyed listening to everyone's comments and feedback on this, and um, it's it's just interesting to me to hear some of the similar things that all of you picked up. You know, I, I think um, some of the the common themes that that I heard are some maybe light citrusy elements in the aroma whether that's the lemon or, or grapefruit, or I think as, as Ryan might have described, the, the light, bright fruit aromas. Um, interesting to hear some of the, the common things that, that you picked up in, in the flavor as well. You know, the, so this was the floral hop. And um, one thing I, I was thinking might be interesting to, to do is at this point in the podcast would be just to – read some of the, the descriptions from the Northern Brewer website about this hop, which is largely what went into my selection process here when, when selecting some, some of the different hops. So, um, you know, okay. this one is, is described as mild, spicy, and floral. Um, it, mm-hmm. it is mild and pleasant aroma with spicy and flowery tones that add character to your home-brewed beers. Um, so, so just interesting to hear everybody's thoughts on this. Um, cool. One, one last comment too. This is actually the probably the least bitter of the hops that I chose. This has a an alpha acid range of between two and four point five percent. So, kind of on the the lower end of the spectrum there. And we've got two more meads to go from Aaron, and I know we've got some scheduling uh, issues coming up here in the next couple of shows. Uh, and I, I wanted everybody to be together. So, uh, we'll talk about this after the show tonight and, uh, see how we're going to approach the other 